How's everybody doing? Hey, thank y'all both for Seth and Anya for getting up here. That is a hard thing to do, to get up here on stage and to speak. So great job. That was really encouraging to hear. Yeah, give it up to Anya and Seth. That was awesome. That was cool. I am super, super excited to get to share God's word and jump into the message tonight. I first have a question. Do you think you have the answer? I think y'all do. Who here would say life is absolutely just crazy right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You would say it's just like chaotic, it is just crazy and busy maybe? Like if I were to ask you personally, like, hey, how are you? You would probably say, you'd probably first say good because everybody in America says, hey, how are you? Good. That's just how it goes. And then if we maybe talked a little bit more, you would say, yeah, I'm just busy. Like we throw the B word around all the time. Busy. That B word, not the other one. And it's just this culture that we constantly are in this place of busyness, like holding it up as if it's a badge, like we deserve like a reward for being busy. I'm waiting to meet someone who I, at the grocery store or at a gas station or wherever, and just ask them, hey, how are you? And they say, you know what? I'm rested and I'm present and I'm just rooted. I'll be like, I would literally maybe pass out because that's just so out of the norm. No one would respond and say, man, I'm just really actually rested right now. Like if I were to meet someone like that, I would be like, man, I want to get to know you. Like teach me your ways because that is not the norm in our culture is busyness. So I want to talk about is exactly that being present over hurry, how God has a lot to say about how we can be present and truly enjoy the good life that we just got done talking about at Harbor Student Weekend. And to be 100% honest with you guys, my, one of my biggest struggles, well, two of them, but one of my biggest is distraction and busyness. Like, I'm like a squirrel half the time. Like, even sitting here and listening to a message, some of you may relate with this as well as just distractions. You're constantly thinking about all these different things you got going on. And I actually have ADD, which is Attention Deficit Disorder. You may have that if you haven't heard of it before. It's just someone who struggles to focus. So with that and sitting with God, it's just extra hard because I'm like thinking of everything else in life that is going on. Like distractions, are they rob me of joy most days and I hate it. It's just hard to pay attention and sit and be still. It's a real struggle on a normal basis for me. And another one is busy, hurry, and just rush, this hustle life. Because what I've believed for so long is if I do more, then I'll be more. Anybody relate to that? Like if I can just do more or get more, if I can get this latest technology or whatever it is, then my life will have just a little bit more value. Maybe you haven't sat in that and thought about it, but that's what all of our culture's pointing to, is if I have more, then I'll be more. In most of my time that I realize, that I recognize, like, why am I distracted? Why am I busy? Is what I'm doing is I'm sacrificing what's important for urgent. And what I mean is there's very urgent things we have. Like, you have to do homework. You need to brush your teeth. And for me personally, like, I have to walk my dog, feed my dog. I love little slapper. Shout out to little slap. She's great. I have to feed James Johnson. He's a big man. That takes groceries and prepping. I have to do a lot of different things, tasks, um, emails, social life. I have to scroll through social media to constantly be in the know. It's these very urgent, like, the now things, I feel as if, take demand. But what's actually important is being with God, sitting in silence and just being still and not constantly running at such a crazy pace where I can't hear God's voice because I'm always doing the urgent. But what's important is being with God and being in prayer to where I can actually hear his voice. Because if you're going at such a crazy pace in life, it is impossible to actually learn from God and sit and hear his voice. There was actually a season in my life where I was graduating college, getting married, running and training for a marathon, and also moving from Virginia to Texas to here to start my career all in one month. Because I fully believed, okay, let me just get it all done because that's the, I thrive off fast, hurry, this crazy pace because I feel as if I'm accomplishing a lot because it feels good to get those kind of compliments because the more I do, the more important I'll be. 
because that's what everyone in culture is kind of advertising. So running at that pace, it was crazy. Because at my core, what I was believing is, man, I didn't want to miss out on something. Like a real fear that we can have sometimes is, oh, I have to be at a part of this. I have to accomplish this. I have to do this. I have to always be up on the latest because I might just miss out on something. Or finding that a busy schedule equals my self-worth. That if my schedule is fully busy with tons of different things, I don't even know I'm saying yes to everything because that will make me more important, that that's my self-worth is found in that. For so long, I believed that. And I know what's true. Everyone who's breathing in this place, who has breath in their lungs, can relate to living a busy, chaotic life. And maybe even the things I listed off or like seem minimal to you and easy because I know I've talked to some of you. You have so much on your plate. Like in sixth grade, you were supposed to figure out what your career is going to be. I'm like, man, in sixth grade, I was just wondering if I was going to ride my skateboard outside, if it was going to rain or not. I used to skateboard. I loved it. It was great. But I'm just saying, I'm talking to some of you. I'm like, man, I'm exhausted just hearing about the things you got going on. You're like more busy than a single mom with five kids and three jobs. I'm not kidding you. It is just crazy. You have so much homework you have to shuffle, and then maybe theater, band, sports, practice for eight hours. I'm just like, I feel for you guys. It's overwhelming. Like to stop and think, how is busyness really working out for you? It's exhausting. Because the root of busyness at its core is we are trying to prove or show our, ourself in proving that we're, we're worthy people, or this achievement base. Like, what is at the core of why you're running at such a crazy, crazy pace? We're trying to find our self-worth and our value. There's this missing of, like, I mean, if you truly know who you are, you won't have to try to earn that. And here's what culture says. Culture says... That fast, hurry, busy, and more are good and productive. Culture advertises this. That's why everything, if you hear somebody say, like, yeah, this movie was good, but it was really slow. It's like, we, we just, everything it has to be fast. Like, if the microwave is not warming up my food fast enough, I'm losing my mind. That's why we got Amazon Prime. Like, we want it now. That's what culture says. Like, it's good. And it's productive. And we pick Take that on to our lives. And here's what God's word says. God's word actually says the opposite. The habits of Jesus, the rhythm and lifestyle of what Jesus modeled was rest. and slow. He was present. He modeled faithfulness, which is holy. And what's really cool is slow. Like whenever you saw Jesus, all through the gospels when you read, people are coming to his feet asking for healing, one of his really good friends, Lazarus, was actually dying, and someone came to Jesus and said, hey, Lazarus is dying, like you need to go over there. It took Jesus two days before he got there because he stayed in the now. This is a medical emergency, but Jesus still stayed and was present and rooted in what was in front of him because he knew that his calling was before God and he knew who he was. He entrusted himself to the Father. Nowhere in scripture will you see that Jesus was in this hurry. Now, he had a full plate. He had a, a full schedule, but he wasn't in a hurry. He didn't model busyness. Jesus knew his identity was in God and not what he did. Your identity is given, not earned. And we're going to talk about that a lot here in a second. But the beauty is is that God delighted in Jesus before he even did any healing or miracle. Get this, students. You can sit in that chair eating Twinkies for the rest of your life, or you can be in the slums of Africa pouring your life out as a living sacrifice, and Jesus won't love you any more or any less. Now, I will say, you may gain weight sitting there in that chair, and you'll miss out on sweet joy, and the, the Bible says a lot about rewards in, the heaven, in heaven, but also... Know this, that you don't, you don't get your worth and value based off of your works. Like, you're not right with God based on how hard you work to earn or prove. Because when God looks at you, he sees Jesus. He doesn't see 
you trying to work really hard because it says, by faith you have been saved. It is by grace, through faith, that you are saved. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It's a great passage that brings truth to that. That, that reality that God delights in us, not because of anything we do, but because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. And that can bring so much peace and rest to some of y'all. I know for me that has freed me of thinking I have to earn or work and prove myself. So then God will love me. But to sit in that reality, that is what Jesus has done for me. I don't have to keep earning and trying to prove. So go with me to Matthew 3. If you have your Bibles, it'll also be on the screen. We'll look at where um, God actually said, hey, I delight in Jesus And this is right after his baptism. It's at the end of Matthew 3, starting in verse 16. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and aligning on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. This beautiful picture, students, that you can just sit in this truth that Jesus, that God delights in you, not for anything, before you do anything for him. This is right after Jesus was baptized, this beautiful picture of that. Like, that should bring so much peace to you, knowing that God delights in you simply for who you are, because you belong to him. So this is right after Jesus' baptism. I want to keep reading in Matthew 4. We'll pick up in verse 1. So right after he gets baptized, so the spiritual high, he goes straight, led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. So pick it up in verse 1 of Matthew 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. In some translations say the desert. To be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. So right here you see this also this attack towards his identity. Hey, if you truly are the Son of God, and Satan will tempt you with that too. Hey, if you truly are a Christian, this temptation against his identity And also the beauty of right after the spiritual high of being baptized, he's led straight into the desert. And the Greek word for that is not like sand and heat, but it's actually this place of getting alone. So he knew that he needed to go away to be present with God. And any video gamers in the house, if you play like a fighting game or something, you realize you have to take your character away to get refueled and restored back to health. Maybe the little bar on top of the head, like, starts to get low. I've seen James play. And he has to, like, actually get away from whatever's going on in the game to be restored. I think that's such a cool picture also for our Christian faith. Realizing, okay, we have to, Jesus is modeling, you have to get away. Scripture says many times in the Gospels, he withdrew. Jesus knew the value of getting away to be present with God. Because then we're about to see here in a second, he was able to be rooted and scripture to combat under temptation. So let's look at verse four in Matthew four. So Satan tempts him and Jesus answers in verse four, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdom of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan. I just... Away from me, Satan. I can only imagine how Jesus had that with so much like intensity. Away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So once again, these two, out of these three temptations, two of them, hey, if you truly are the son of God, this, hey, if you are who you say you are, 
If you truly are a Christian, and then the third temptation, he says, hey, don't you want more? He took him to the highest mountain and said, this can all be yours. Once again, the lie of, hey, don't you want more because more is better? Jesus models for us first being present and rooted and got alone with the Father. He was able to truly combat temptation. This picture for us to see, students, that we have to get away to be rooted and grounded in God's truth for when temptation of distraction or the busy lifestyle becomes more tempting than being with God. And there's many places all through scripture you'll read where Jesus was pressed by many different people to do healing. There were so many needs that Jesus had, but what he did is he lived an interrupted lifestyle, but not a busy, hurried, rushed lifestyle because he knew what was important. And for many of us, what we can maybe struggle with with not being present is living maybe in the past or in the future. It's easy to do that because there's things in the past that can just hold us down and keep us from truly being able to focus in the now that you're distracted from things or you're really worried with things that are going on in the future. So just a diagram that can help. If you have your journals, you can draw this or just take a picture after I'm done with it. And this can help maybe for some of you to visually see why there's certain things in your life that are keeping you from being present. Past, present, and future. Now, Satan would love nothing more than for us to live in the past or the future because he knows there we can't be present and rooted in God. And for some of us, if we're living and struggling to live in the past, we can live in what's called the if only. Basically saying, if only things were different. If only this wasn't part of my story. If only I didn't have these type of struggles, or if only I didn't do this, or this wasn't done to me. We all have things that we can actually sit in and go back and forth with, with a list of if only just things were a little different, if I didn't struggle in this way. Because what that brings when we live in the past is regret, shame, anger, and maybe restlessness. Regret, wishing things didn't happen a certain way, maybe shame of this was done to me, anger, not being able to forgive, maybe something has just been done to you, bullying or anything like that, that can cause so much just pain in your life that you're na never able to really be present. Because a lot of times, I know for myself something that I've just ignored, that God's brought to my attention that I've been able to work through is many, many days if I'm busy is because I'm running from something. There is difficult things in my past that I want to leave untouched or undealt with because those emotions are too much. So it's way easier to just live a very busy schedule, be around people constantly, therefore I don't have to sit in silence. There is a lot of people all across this world who are running from something, and that's why busyness seems to be more attractive. And I realized that whenever I would get alone, I would start to have to deal with hard things, and I would just escape to scrolling on my phone. I don't want to sit in that pain. And in Romans 8, 1, It says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. To speak that over my life many days where I need it, knowing, man, yes, this is my story. These things have happened in my past. I cannot change them. But I do have a choice to bring them to the Father. Just as we sang the song, come to the altar. Because if you leave things undone, they will only come back worse. But you have to go to that pain to actually feel it and heal it. But yes, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. But now Jesus says, hey, let's actually walk through that stuff of your past together to where you can find healing from it. Because if you run from it, it only gets worse. So you have to learn to release 
Release the things that are maybe keeping you in chains from not being able to live in the present. Many times you may have friends that you feel like you're talking to them and hanging out, and they're just not listening to you. There's been many times that James has been like, did you even listen to what I just said? I'm like, uh-huh. It's because I'm, sometimes there's been things that I have anger, I have unforgiven things I need to talk out with people, and I'm not present. So you can't listen whenever you still have undealt with things in your past, and Jesus wants us to bring that to him. And for the future, what can happen is we can live in the what if. What if this happens? What if I don't get into the college? What if I get injured and I can't play sports? I remember when I played basketball, I was never free to play basketball. After four ACL tears, I was afraid I would tear it again. Like I was living in the what if. Like what if something bad happens to me? Or your biggest fear, whatever it is. It could happen, it most likely won't happen. But is to follow it all the way through, knowing that, okay, if this does happen, God will take care of me. But what we do is we sit and we fantasize and we sit in the what if, and it can control us to where we're not present. Because what that brings on is fear, anxiety, control, and same as living in the past, restlessness. Constantly, you can't be at rest when you're living in the past or the future. Because you're living in the, if only this was different, if you're living in the future, it's, man, what if this happens? I remember this big fear I've had that just kept me so anxious all the time is what if my parents get in a car accident? Like, I, I'm doing that to myself. I'm playing that in my head. And God just as lovingly says, okay, I'm gonna take care of you in that. I literally sit there and play it out, okay, if this worst thing were to happen, what is true is God will never leave me nor forsake me. And I know I have a harbor community that will come alongside me. Same for you, whatever the biggest fear, if I get rejected, what if I lose all my friends? What if this person doesn't like me? Or what if I'm single for the rest of my life? All of these different fears that culture can sometimes rob us in. Satan would love nothing more for us to live in the past or the future. And learning to surrender Because when we're trying to control, there's no room for God to really move in our lives. And in Matthew 6, the Sermon on the Mount, towards the end, Jesus says, man, don't be anxious about your life. He knew we would be so prone to live in the future. There's so much in Scripture that's saying, hey, don't be anxious. Let tomorrow worry about itself. Worrying won't add a day to your life. God knew that there would be this temptation for us to live in the what if. But God desires so much for us to live in the present and the now so we can live in the even if. Even if this happens, whatever fear you have, life doesn't turn out the way you want it to, you don't get into the college you want, whatever that worst thing that could ever happen to you in your life, even if, as a believer, God will care for us. He will take care of us. Anything that happens to us that's happened in the past that seems to rob us of being present, God wants us to bring that to him. Because being in the present, you experience freedom, joy, contentment, and true rest. Living in the even if Not in the if only or the what if, but even if. And this sounds great, but to do it on a normal basis, like to look at this diagram and say, yes, Katie, I don't want to keep being robbed by my shame or whatever it could be. I don't want to keep living by this fear. I want to experience this freedom, joy, contentment. You don't have to keep earning and proving, but you can truly actually rest. You have to answer a big question Very simple, but can be very complex. Who am I? 
Now, for the person who doesn't follow Jesus, who hasn't stepped into this relationship with him and surrendered leadership of their life, that's a weighty question to feel because the busy life makes sense. If there's, this is all there is to life, then yeah, keep earning and proving, and in the end, there's no hope. That's a huge, huge question to feel. And if in your squad groups tonight, spend time saying, hey, I don't know how to answer that question. And here's what Jesus taught us, right, that we just read. Hey, if you truly are the son of God, Jesus knew who he was and he was able to be rooted and present. And as the believer in the room, is basically a question of identity. And that truth is child of God. Forgiven, made new. Righteous, holy, pure. Royal priesthood. The list goes on and on and on. And my favorite one is eternally secure. Because whenever you're tempted to lean over here, you're eternally secure. Follow that fear all the way and look it in the face and remind it of truth that this is who you are. For the believer in the room, this can be the peace and rest for your souls that you don't have to keep earning and proving by staying so busy because a busy lifestyle is restless. It's one that truly doesn't know your truth and identity. This will free you so much of chasing after everything that culture says, more is better. And a beautiful place in scripture that kind of captures all of this for believers is uh, Mary and Martha. Just how Jesus encounters two women and one, Mary, sits at Jesus' feet and Martha's busy doing all of these different activities. And it's so easy to get caught up in doing for God rather than being with God. And Jesus says, no, Mary has found what is right. She is sitting at Jesus' feet while Martha is trying to figure out all of these different ways to really make Jesus proud of her. And as Christians, we can get caught up in doing that. But to know that Jesus, much rather you be with him and be rooted in truth rather than do all of these different things to earn your worth. And just in closing, my encouragement is for you to sit and just acknowledge before God, like, man, this is where I'm at, and I really want to be rooted in what's true, in your identity. What you have to learn is to stop and be still. You cannot run at a crazy pace and expect to hear the voice of God, because two things are true. You will constantly say, man, I am spiritually dry, or I just don't have time for my Bible. Most students that walk into our offices say, I just, I didn't do my quiet time. The reality is, is you're too busy for God. Like we can keep saying that on and on and on, but there has to be margin in your life. And just some simple ways that I've created margin that have helped me is I practice a Sabbath every Friday. And I filter it through the thought of, man, is this restful and is it worship? And by worship, I mean just honoring to God. And I'm learning to just sit every morning for four minutes. I set the timer. Many days, like I said, I have ADD, so I'm all over the place. But I'll sit with God for four minutes. I just set my timer, and it's so sweet. All of a sudden, these thoughts and emotions that I've not dealt with start to come in. And from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m., I have no social media. And it is sweet because I go to bed thinking about the Lord, and I wake up. And the first thing is in a screen of seeing things that have happened in life but it's learning to just sit and be still and be present with God, but you have to create that margin. So just some ending challenges I have for you, and these, you don't have to do all of them, but they're, I challenge you all to do all of them, but they're basic ones that you can take into a rhythm of your life that will help you be still and present to where you can model a lifestyle of truly being able to live in the present. One is if you have a car, drive in silence for three days. Maybe at the first of every month, just whenever you need it and you know how to navigate that. And if you don't drive, these are other ones, like put your phone away for five hours once a week. That's not varsity Christianity. I can promise you, you can do it. But just put your phone away, maybe while you're just doing homework or something. 
Put these rhythms into your life, students. I promise you, you will see God in such amazing, miraculous ways. You are missing out on so much sweet, deep connection with God if you're not slowing down. In silence every day for four minutes. Maybe you start with one minute. I don't know. I'm at eight minutes now. I love it. And having ADD and being crazy, it's like many days, my mind's everywhere, but I still keep showing up every morning. It's just sitting with God. And last is take this diagram, take a picture of it, teach it to somebody. Just like Anya said, she's now, after Harvest Week Weekend, able to share her faith with more of her friends. Just take this diagram, maybe teach it to one of your parents at home, but just to, and that could lead into sharing the gospel with someone, answering the question of, hey, how do you answer who are you? Who am I? It's tough, but this is sweet, sweet stuff. Grant's going to come up here, and he's going to sing a song that just really goes well with how to learn how to live a present life over hurry. So my encouragement is to sit and truly allow yourself to look at your schedule, your pace of life that you have, and is it honoring to God? Because you're missing out on so much sweet joy with the Lord. (laughs) 